That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your live stream or your podcast of choice. My name is John Greenwald Jr., owner and creator of theblackvault.com. And this is a pretty fun story, one of which that I broke today. And that is all about how the Department of Defense is denying what I believe are key records on the creation of their UFO office. I'm using that as a nickname. Let me pull up some visuals for you guys and kind of go over the story itself. For those of you who are watching on social media, uh, this is a story that I dropped early this morning. And essentially this is going into great detail about what I just got through the Freedom of Information Act. Now, some of you who are either new to this channel or you think you've heard this story, it does sound very familiar to something I wrote about a week, week and a half ago. That got mainstream coverage around the globe. I was very excited to see that because it's a very important topic, uh, UAP as a whole, UFOs as a whole, but also the secrecy surrounding it. That was a different story, however. That was all about the Navy admitting that there are UFO videos in addition to what we've seen publicly, but they are denying all of us access to it. So what what um, this story is all about was me going after documents on the original, and I will say original, um, prior to what's called the AOI MSG, or let me make sure I get this uh, acronym right, the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. <laughs> it's a handful, uh, mouthful. Uh, prior to that, there was the UAP Task Force. Uh, you may have re re uh, heard that referred to as the UAPTF. But it seemed like that was a very informal, very unstructured effort to look into UAP that has kind of exploded uh, with public interest here in the last five years or so. So the UAPTF kind of came together, they were looking into these things. But in November of 2021, a much more structured effort called the AOI MSG, uh, or how they pronounced it phonetically, AIMSOG, don't ask me why, uh, during the UAP hearings, uh, they referred to it as AIMSOG. That essentially was a much more structured effort to look into UAP, the potential threats that they posed and tried to understand exactly what it was. Now, it seems like as soon as that was created and seemingly like not even off the ground, uh, the AIMSOG was renamed. So before I go into this story, let me preface it with some of you who may be thinking, hey, this is old. Well, keep in mind when I filed this Freedom of Information Act request, it was actually the day after they issued the announcement, this memo here signed by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, that established AIMSOG. So I had filed the next day. So ARO, which is the new one, uh, <laughs> acronyms are getting insane. Trust me, you're spot on by thinking that. Uh, it was That didn't even exist yet. So the FOIA request was all about AIMSOG, because that was the only thing that existed at the time. But then also, they searched for records about the creation of it. Uh, my request, and let me read it specifically to you. Let me uh, scroll to exactly what it said. I sought after all records pertaining to the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AIMSOG, and the Airborne Object Identification and Management Executive Council. I have no idea how they pronounce that acronym. That was essentially a, a group in addition to AIMSOG that offered some oversight and, and some direction for AIMSOG. The request uh, I also stipulated to include, uh, but not be limited to, all letters, memos, emails sent to and from related parties. I also put in the, in the FOIA request that I, that I agreed to have the FOIA officer essentially use their best judgment on who to search, because I wouldn't know that unless I worked within the DOD. So I kind of let their, their FOIA officer decide that. It's a little risky, obviously, but you know, the, a lot of times FOIA offices will help you and, and do their best effort. So I, I thought that that was okay in this, um, in this case. Uh, also asked for mission statements, PowerPoint presentations, draft documents about the creation of those two groups, et cetera. Now, what was the response was that they found, according to them, 50 pages 
total. So everything that I named up here, they found 50 pages responsive to that. The question mark is what was withheld because they were withholding 23 of those 50 pages in full. And according to their letter, they were currently improperly classified in the interest of national security. So here we go again with that national security that they did not want to tell you or I or show you or I any of this material or excuse me, about half of the material uh, that they denied because of national security reasons. What's interesting is they also broke down the part of the executive order 13526 again, in plain English, that essentially means uh, the it, it defines secrecy, it defines classification levels. And they break it down by saying what applies from that are sections 1.4 a, which are military plans, weapon systems and operations, 1.4 C intelligence activities, including special activities, intelligence sources or methods, and 1.4 G vulnerabilities or capabilities of systems, installations, infrastructures, projects, plans, or protection services relating to national security. So that is their reasoning for denying those 23 pages in full. So we won't see those. Now I have appealed, I'll just jump ahead to that part of the story. So I am fighting for them, but essentially for national security reasons, they did not want to tell me. They did release 27 pages. I'll kind of quickly go over some of them, but first I want to talk to the key parts of this. And in those 27 pages, I can tell you that the meat of what was there, what I call the main core of it, were emails that were sent back and forth, essentially about the creation of AIMSOG and trying to determine the scope and the mission. That's obviously what goes into the, the pre-planning for them that led to that memo that I already showed you establishing the group. Problem was that the majority of it was all blacked out. So even though they withheld the 23 pages in full, they didn't even black it out. They just withheld them. Now we've got 27 other pages to look at, but sadly the stuff that actually would be interesting is heavily blacked out. But here's some of the key points that you can determine from this that I thought was kind of interesting. A new name got, got put into the mix. And for all the FOIA people out there, I always like to add these little tips and, and tricks if this is your, your first type of video. You always look for the very smallest of nugget in these FOIA requests because on the surface you look at it and they're all blacked out and you know, or the majority is blacked out and you go, well, that's really useless, this sucks. And you throw it behind you into the, into the paper shredder and, uh, and forget about it. I always urge you don't read every single line, look at every single character, because in this particular case, a name was revealed, Mark Elliott. And when you look into his background, he's the director for technical collection within the office of the undersecretary of defense for intelligence. Now, why does this matter? It's just a new name, a new government official who cares, but this now opens up new avenues to explore through FOIA. It's a new email box to put requests on. It's a new person to watch out for. So that's where this kind of becomes interesting because this guy seemingly was very involved uh, in the creation of AIMSOG. Prior to this, I don't believe that was known. So that's something that you look out for that you could easily miss. And let me prove that point because the next person is this gentleman here, Matthew Cummings. Now, Matthew Cummings, you can see from the documents, if you look closely, is the deputy director technical collection. That means that he works with this man here and is his deputy. And it appears that both of those gentlemen played a role in the creation of AIMSOG. Yet again, why is that important? Sounds pretty dry. Some of you are like this, John is really boring. Uh, but that's why. That's why you look at this, because now this is completely opened up. But let me prove my point where this guy has shown up in my FOIA request before, but he's easily overlooked. In a Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General, uh, actually two requests, it yielded a bunch of emails. Same instance as like this. Only problem was that the majority of it was blacked out. However, one name was not. 
Matthew Cummings, this gentleman here. But there was no context whatsoever. We had no idea who he was. He could just be anybody that was CC'd on those uh, Office of the Inspector General emails. So kind of overlooked it. Uh, not necessarily overlooked it, but there's nothing you can do with that. With this, we now know his title. We now know he works under him. We now know he creates uh, or created or helped create or something with AIMSOG. So these are people that we definitely look into. So again, kind of dry, totally get it. I'm not reading the comments, but I'm sure during this <laughs> behind the scenes, if you're, if you're joining those, uh, the comments are like, you know, who cares? But that's why you look for these little avenues to explore because these new people appear. And then these are all avenues to, to research. But here for me was the more... I would say interesting document that came out of the release. Let me switch screens here, make sure it comes up. This is the staff summary sheet that was released with that Kathleen Hicks establishment memo that I, that I again, already showed you in this video. This was attached to, the, to, to that memo in the FOIA release. And why I'm saying that is this was, uh, this was never public from what I understand. I checked with a couple other researchers that also go after uh, documents like this. Hey, have you ever seen this attached to Kathleen Hicks memo? No, nobody that I had spoken with today had seen it. Now, why is this important? What I can deduce about these sheets is essentially on, on the creation of an office like AIMSOG, there's coordinated efforts to, to essentially create such an effort. And sometimes you have a lot of voices it's the government, it's the Department of Defense. There's a heck of a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So these types of sheets allow them to essentially keep track of those who are being uh, coordinated with and what their feedback may be. Now, B6 exemption is privacy. So we don't know the names, but that's okay. Because these specific departments or or I should say components within the Department of Defense all played a role in the coordination for AIMSOG. And all of these put their input in. And what it shows is really the extent of how far AIMSOG started to stretch throughout the inside of the DOD. And that's an important um that's an important distinction because now we know within these offices, all these acronyms, they somehow have a hand in their UFO research effort. And what was true with AIMSOG is likely going to be true with Arrow. Now, that's a totally different video and, and subject in itself. But regardless, you can see where I'm going with this because now we have a blueprint. Back to my FOIA people out there. Now we have a roadmap of what components to search. Because you can't just file a, a um, request to the DOD and say, I want all emails searched for this keyword or that keyword, because there are so many different components within the DOD. So they'll come back to you and say, hey, this is too broad. The DOD is a very wide ranging um, department with many components and branches and, and offices and so on and so forth. So this is the roadmap. And that's why pages like this are incredibly important. But when you scroll down, you'll see here the subject, AIMSOG establishment. This is prior to that uh, November memo, memo. So you're obviously seeing the work to uh, establish that, that AIMSOG effort because it had not been made public at this point. Here's the purpose to obtain the deputy secretary's approval to establish the airborne object identification and management synchronization group, AIMSOG, as the successor to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, or UAPTF. We already went over that. Background. The Department of the Navy has run the UAPTF since August of 2020. However, the recent report on UAP by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence highlighted that the scope of the problem extends significantly beyond the purview of the Navy and warrants a broader approach. In June 2021, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Hicks requested uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security deliver a plan to formalize the mission of the UAPTF into an enduring activity. AIMSOG was the re result. When you get into the discussion heading, all of that 
is exempted from release. B5 is essentially internal deliberation. That's kind of the the um, nutshell explanation, and it goes much more in depth in the legal jargon, but I won't bore you to death. Uh, but essentially, they're saying that this is internal deliberation. They're still establishing AIMSOG, so they don't want to tell you what they're discussing. Same with the recommendations here under B5. Uh, the acting director for technical collection, I believe that would be Elliot, but maybe somebody was acting director at, at this time. I, I don't know. Uh, but regardless, they redacted that for, for privacy reasons. And then down here are the attachments. Action memo for the DepSec Def or Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, and it goes throughout the others. All of which, which I'll show you here in a minute, uh, were released in the FOIA. The draft implementation guidance for reference only, that was not. I believe that that is one of the documents withheld. So you can see that these little nuggets become very, very valuable to trying to figure out where to go next. Now, I do have a, another case for Arrow, uh, very similar to this. We'll see what that yields. And this specific request, which let me pull up the documents, which are here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. This was the release letter. I have uh, an update from the DOD that they searched for records on this case through December of 2021. So the records that were created after that, I created a case for those. Then for the arrow material, that will be at the end of AIMSOG through today. Uh, well, you know, to the date of processing the request. So you can see it gets a little complicated. You have to keep track of which request is going to which time frame because if you lose track of that and you 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 can lose information because if something really killer happened in January of 2022 about AIMSOG, this request would not have yielded that really cool event or document or PowerPoint presentation. So you have to continually follow up uh, to see where that cutoff date is and then create new requests. So make sure that uh, if you are filing FOIA requests to, to, to do that. So here's some of the uh, information that was released. This is, again, that FOIA release packet. This is everything. This is Kathleen Hicks' memo. Uh, we don't have to go through it uh, in detail. I invite you to read it. Uh, but this is where that staff summary sheet that I just went over was attached. So that's, again, very cool because that has never been in the public domain before. Here are the emails, which then again become interesting because a lot of it is redacted. A lot of the information that would be key to understanding the scope of AOI MSG and how it was created, why, exactly why it was created, what were they seeing on the inside that led them up to the establishment of the office. All of that is likely bantered in here, uh, but, but the majority of it is uh, redacted. We can also determine that the effort was created in a secret environment. That is, uh, again, the classification secret. So it is at that, that level. Let me see if you could see this on your screen. They likely printed this out, used black marker, then scanned it in. It's not any secret that we can see the secret designation, but again, you can at least verify the security classification level of this entire effort. You can see here, no foreign, that's no foreign intelligence. So they wanna make sure that no one outside the United States gets this, this information. So I'm not gonna go make this a deep dive and go through every email, because you can see a lot of it is, you know, some banter back and forth and uh, stuff that, um, you know, will be kind of pointless to go over. Uh, but one of the big things I would say that was interesting to me anyway, and I'll go back to the article itself to show you. Was this here? This is called a classification block. And this accompanies a lot of emails generally at the top, bottom, or both. It shows you the classification of what you're dealing with, who classified it, and under what authority. So if you're communicating within the Pentagon on a secure server, you get something that is secret. Generally, you will see a classification block on who classified it and what authority or where it was derived from. You can see here that Matthew Cummings was the one classifying some of this material. Uh, it shows that, again, he's got a hand in it. He's not just CC'd because he's in whatever office. 
that essentially I think that he probably has a, a bigger role in this than just being on a CC list. The um, classification was derived from the Defense Intelligence Agency Security Classification Guide dated 2007. Yes, I'm going after that. I don't think that's been released before. So you always, you know, essentially look for those little nuggets. And you can see here that the classified material, they aim to keep it all classified until 2046. I always aim to change that with the FOIA. And yes, I have uh, many success stories when it comes to that. A lot of people think that you can't do that that once it says that it's not going to be declassified for decades, that they stick with it. That's not true. I've got quite a few examples of that. I also have a lot of failures. So <laughs> that happens as well. So um, if you're going to go after document declassification, mandatory declassification reviews, that is uh, something to be prepared for because it happens. You get shot down. They uh, don't want to give it to you. And it's quite the fight. Last thing uh, that I'll go over before I end this, uh, this update to you is what didn't they include and how many documents were there? Well, we know the, the page count. We know that 23 pages were withhold, withheld in full. What does that mean? You know, how many documents is that? Is, is, could that be something else? Uh, I'm not really sure. I do have a message into the DOD to try and break that down. I have appealed this case, as I said. That way we can try and get uh, some kind of uh, additional release. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but you can see these were the files that were that were sent to me as part of that release packet. I'm showing you six. There were actually seven. The seventh was just my request. I, I Nobody really cares about that. So I deleted that PDF on the screenshot. But you'll see here the final response letter and then all of the attached documents, uh, which I just kind of quickly went over in brief. I'll go back and go through the end. Uh, but you'll see the document numbers one, two, three, five, and 10. You note the missing numbers. So that gives you an idea of how many are missing, which would be four, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, that gives us a, again, a, an indication of what they're withholding. Uh, and that plays a role in the appeal. So that, that gives you some kind of indicator of how they've, they've withheld material. As I kind of, again, went over, those were the emails. I invite you to download all of those that's in the show notes below that, that'll link over to my article. You'll have much more detail, including the documents themselves. You'll see some of the other memos. This was Kathleen Hicks' memo that she uh, had sent out to, she didn't say AIMSOG, but she was essentially telling them to create something like AIMSOG. And then you fast forward to November, that's when it was established. So this was that memorandum that came out in June when the UAP report was, was released to the public. This to me was more interesting than the UAP report itself, even though that was valuable for other reasons. This I, I found fascinating because this led to AIMSOG and now Arrow. Last is the congressional language. So internally at the DOD, they were circulating a document that included all of the UAP related language. Again, I won't go through it and make this a deep dive, but you can see they, they were watching all of this. The highlight was, um, I, I, I don't think relevant to this, if I remember, this was all about uh, just uh, something unrelated to UAP, but it came up in, in my request. Uh, and then later you'll see the UAP task force language and, and so on. So a lot of different bills and, and verbiage that was combined into this packet. So it all came up into my request, which all led to AIMSOG. So that's the update. A uh, lot of fun to write these stories. I know sometimes they're not always international breaking news, going to go viral type stories, but these are incredibly important to showcase the ever increasing secrecy about UAP and UFOs. I have another video on this channel. If this is your first time here, make sure that you go to, to the YouTube listing of all the videos and, and something that I published in just the last week or so was all about the secrecy and how, even though some people think we're in this era of transparency, quite the contrary, we're not. And you can see that from the Navy decisions. You can see that from, from what I just went over with you now. And as we continue to chisel away as much as we can, and we find these little nuggets, we're also seeing that increasing 
layer of secrecy that just, in my opinion, is clamping down harder and harder on this topic, despite hearing Congress say the, the words unidentified aerial phenomena and, and people are seeing it in congressional language. This is the result. And it's a lot of secrecy. I'm going to end you with this. A lot of people will think uh, a lot of what a lot of people think that throw um, we'll call them shots at me, my biggest haters. Uh, they think FOIA is a waste of time. And they think that stories like this are just, you know, biding the time until the congressional language all passes and there's immunity and everybody's going to come forward and there's just going to be this new era of transparency. Here's the the response that I have that I think a lot of people don't recognize. And I just saw a clip the other day. It was between uh, Rand Paul and Anthony Fauci, unrelated to UAP, obviously, but it was about the Senate requesting information from the NIH and getting denied that information. Do you know what they did? They filed FOIA requests. And in that congressional hearing, Rand Paul talked about the FOIA requests that he filed and or his office, whoever you know signed it. Uh, but the senators file FOIA requests too. So, so many think that the Senate just has this wielding power to say, all right, DOD, I want you to give me those videos and we're going to release them to the public. They don't. They fall back on the FOIA just as much. And Paul actually had said to Fauci, their FOIA requests were being denied. So it does not matter if you're a senator, congressman, or some guy who lives in a black vault, you're all treated the same. And it is the FOIA that defines what is going to be declassified, or at least it's rooted uh, to the, the um, executive orders and security classification guides on what determines a public release of information versus secrecy and more secrecy and more secrecy. So I know we want to hang on to come on Senator whomever to start demanding answers. But as proven time and time again, it doesn't matter if they're a senator. Uh, a lot of that will happen behind closed doors. And if they do want public transparency or answers, an agency can still push back and they still fall back to FOIA. So all the haters out there that want to keep trash in FOIA, you can wait for the senators if you'd like, but listen to them because they use the FOIA as a tool as well. And I recommend all of you to do the same. I'm always interested in your comments. If you're watching here on YouTube, make sure you look below, give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and post your views, your questions, uh, even your disagreement with me. It's all good. Just keep it respectful. I'm always interested in that. And if you aren't aware, uh, I also drop a lot of these presentations to audio podcast versions as well. It's under the Black Vault Radio on any podcast network out there including iTunes, Spotify, whatever you listen to, uh, make sure that you uh, that you uh, subscribe to that and vice versa to the YouTube channel. If you're listening and didn't know I had a YouTube channel, go to www.theblackvault.com slash live and it will forward you right to it. That said, thank you guys so much for listening and watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off and we'll see you next time. <laughs>